let's turn to Matthew chapter 7. And I am just going to use this as a jump off. Um, there are uh, several verses that we're going to deal with today. But I do want to start. This is just kind of a foundation. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 20. And uh, I'm reading from a New American Standard Version. And the word of the Lord says, So then, you will know them by their fruits. King James says, Wherefore, by their fruit, ye shall know them. And the New Living, Translation, New Living Translation says, Yes, just as you can identify a tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions true disciples. Amen. And so I want to talk to you today about where is the evidence? Where is the evidence? So since the beginning of this year, um, visitors, uh, our pastors have been preaching on the person, work, and ministry of the Holy Spirit. Uh, been good word. They would, they've talked to us about being filled with the Spirit, uh, walking in the Spirit. We spent several weeks on the fruit of the Spirit, really diving into the nine graces, the love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, all, all nine of those. We've, we've delved into that. We've been taught who the Holy Spirit is and who he is not. Amen. So we have been well fed on the Holy Spirit. And so as I was asked, given this assignment, the question that I ponder and the question that I have pondered since January uh, in this teaching is what does this look like in my life? What does it look like? What, what, what does being filled in the spirit looks like? What does walking in the spirit looks like? What does it look like for the nine graces to manifest uh, in my life? And the scripture says, you will know them by the fruit. Just as we know about that tree, we can identify that tree by its fruit, so you can identify people by their actions. So again, I ask you the question, where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? In John 20 and 22, Jesus after he, has, after he has resurrected from the grave, he appears to the disciples in the midst of them. And the scripture says that he breathed on the disciples. He breathed on the disciples. And he said, receive the Spirit. And so when I, when I look at that and kind of dissected that, it there's this essence that Jesus literally, his spirit, he breathed on them and said, now take it and receive it. Be filled with it. Walk in it. Let it manifest in your life. And I'm here to tell you, Jesus is still breathing, and we still have the choice to receive. Amen? And so that's what we have done. We have received the spirit. But what does that look like? You know, because I don't know about y'all, but I've walked, around, I've been around some people who said they were filled, and they was walking in the spirit, and I wanted to ask which one. I wanted to ask which one, because I wasn't so sure. But we can be sure today of which spirit that we walk in, that evidence. So a few days ago, even in, in the midst of me preparing this message, I shared with the 8 o'clock service, that I was in my office sitting uh, with a young lady. She had come in, and she wanted to talk about what her future educational plans were. Uh, I work in adult literacy uh, at, at, at Atlanta Technical College, and so we're mapping out what she's going to do beyond receiving her high school credential. And as we're talking in dialogue and I'm asking some thought-provoking questions. Just in the midst of our conversation, she looks at me, and she says, Ms. Jackson, are you a Christian? And if you work in education, you already know we can't talk about 
God in, in, at work. But if they open up the door for us, we can then begin to dialogue. Amen. And y'all know all this stuff we see on Facebook and the news. They need Jesus in the education system. Yeah, we need it. You know, I mean, we got a family bearing their child because of a fight. Jesus is needed in the educational system. And so as she said that, I smiled. So I was like, yes, this is my little door over here. And uh, I said, yes, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. I said, I am. And I said, what made you ask me that? And she said, well, I'm, I'm watching you. I'm watching your mannerisms. I'm listening to how you're talking to me and you're engaging me. And she said, it's just something about you. It's just something about you. Have you ever walked up on something? It was just something about them that you knew. You know, they said spirit knows spirit. Good or bad, a spirit knows a spirit. And so that blessed me, but I, had, I continued to think, what evidence did she see? What did she see? And that's a question I want to pose to you. Where is the evidence? What's the evidence that you are filled? that you are walking, that you are manifesting the fruit of the Spirit. And so you know this, we've been taught, like I said, who he is, what he does. We've been challenged. But I ask you, ponder that question. Begin to examine your life. Because you know, you know when there's been a change. You know when there's been a shift. If you know you, and if you're real and honest about you, because, you know, we can fake people out, but we know who we are. We know what we're capable of doing. Amen? And so when we think about it, I want you to think, as I, as I, as I talk about who he is in the works, think about how is this manifesting? What fruit is coming from this? And then there are a couple of areas that I'm going to uh, key in on, but he's a comforter. How is, how is him being a comforter being seen in your life? He's our paraclete, our helper, who comes alongside. See, and here's part, of, here's part of our challenge when I think about the evidence, and I think sometimes this is why the evidence is not as clear, because we think that we done got saved, and we have to walk this journey by ourselves, that we just by ourselves. But Jesus said, I got to go. But I'm not going to leave you by yourself. Right. I'm going to send somebody right, not, not to follow behind you, not to get ahead of you, but somebody that's going to come alongside you and you walk this thing out. And here's what we do. We either think he up here or he back here or he ain't nowhere to be found and we got to walk this thing by ourselves. We are out of line and out of alignment. Hear me. We are out of line and out of alignment because we have not been called to journey by ourselves. We have the Holy Spirit. Don't ever say I'm by myself in this journey. It's not the truth. They call that a lie. We are not alone. He's our paraclete. He's come alongside to help us. And the ultimate goal, the ultimate assistance, is that we live a life that glorifies God. I don't care what else you're trying to do. I don't care what else you are doing. Your ultimate goal is to live a life so that God is glorified. So if your name ain't ever in lights, but you live in a life that glorifies God, you have done what you needed to do. If they don't ever call your name out, but if you are living a life aligned with what this word says and that God is getting the glory, you have done what you were supposed to do. Amen? So he's our paraclete. He's our paraclete. But not only that, Paul's, Paul identifies him in several different terms. He said he's the spirit of life, which means he has come to main, not only to maintain life, but to sustain life. 
to set us free from this law of sin and death that we find ourselves constantly being submitted to. And as believers, we don't have to because he is the spirit of life. And when we embrace that, when we can live that abundant life that John 10, 10 talks about. So he's a spirit of life. But not only does Paul say he's a spirit of life, he said he's a spirit of adoption. He has enabled us to receive this position of being a joint heir with Christ. We don't come into that on our own. The spirit of adoption has done that for us. He's our intercessor. He is praying for us. So now I don't ever say nobody praying for me. Yes, the spirit is praying for you. He is your intercessor. So where's the evidence in your life? Not only that, Isaiah does an awesome job in chapter 11. He says he's the spirit of wisdom. He is the source of all supernatural knowledge and understanding. So when you think you got it, it ain't you. You didn't do it. You didn't come up with that genius idea. That was all spirit. Amen? Not only that, he's the spirit of understanding. He's the spirit of knowledge. He's the spirit of might. So whatever strength you have, it's because he is inside of you, manifesting himself as the spirit of might. But that's, that's just who he is. But here's what he has done for us. He is working in our lives. He's making us alive. Things that should have taken us out and down has not because he has quickened us from the inside. Things that should have, people looking at you going, you should have been counted out and down and gone, but the spirit of God is in you quickening. You know, I said quickening, just giving you a charge, like an electric charge that makes you alive again. And so when the enemy has counted you out, the Spirit of God has rose up in you and quickened you to do the things that God has called you. He dwells in us. He makes his home. He abides. Where is the evidence of him in your life? He leads. He leads. You ever want you you had those moments where you coming home, you went one way, you didn't go your normal way, and you're trying to figure out, well, why am I being led this way, Lord? And you just never know. How many accidents have been, you've been uh, avoided? How many paths you crossed for people who may have been at the end of their, their journeys? I remember one time I was in my early 20s, and we were doing a witnessing campaign, and we were knocking on the door of this guy's house, and we kept being insistent, come to find out the man was in there contemplating suicide. It was a house we weren't even assigned to be at. He leads. Sometimes he leads and we don't, God, this seems crazy, but I'm going to go with you anyway. Because he has a different perspective from what we see. I, I think about that verse, you will hear that voice behind me saying, this is the way, walking in it. But I want you to get the picture, the voice behind you, which means he sees farther than what you can see. And so when you hear that voice, it may not make sense, but this is the way I want you to go because I know what's getting ready to happen. So he leads us. He fills us. He brings the word to our remembrance. Scriptures that I didn't even know I knew come up at a time. I'm like, when did I remember that? But that's what he does. That's his work in our lives. He helps us to pray. He regenerates. He convicts. Where is the evidence? And so as, as, as we think about who he is, as we think about what he does in our lives, I the question, where is it most visible? What areas of our lives do we see these things? Do we see him demonstrated in our lives? Got three areas, and then I'm, I'm going to sit down, and we're going to be out of here. Amen? But the first, the first, the first area that I want to share is that we, have, we can see evidence in our thinking. 
Our thinking has to be different. If you are filled, if you are walking, if the fruit is manifesting, your thinking has to be different. You just can't think the same way you used to. Amen? Just, we just ended our spring small group, and I led a session. I facilitated a small group on um, think differently. And the whole premise of the book was nothing is different till you think differently. Nothing is different till you think differently. Now think about that. You got something in your life you want to change? You got something in your life that needs to change? The question I have for you, are you thinking differently? Have you changed your perspective? Have you gotten a hold of this word and see what God has said about that? Are you thinking differently? Because nothing will change. Nothing will be different until you think differently. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5, and this is in the uh, Common English Bible. I, I love the way it reads. It says, although we live in the world, we do not fight our battles with human methods. Our weapons that we fight with aren't human, but instead they are powered by God for the destruction of fortresses of strongholds. They destroy arguments and every defense that is raised up to oppose the knowledge of God. They capture every thought. I didn't say one thought. I said every thought and make it obedient to Christ. So until you begin to shift your thinking, but how, where's the evidence? that your thinking is shifting? Do you approach situations thinking, how I'm going to handle this? Or do you approach it, okay, God, what do we do with this? What's your mindset when you go into a difficult situation? Do you think I got to do this on my own? Or God, what, what we doing? How do I do this? Do I say something? What do I do? What is your thinking? And let me, tell, let, me, let me show you this, because we, we talked about this in our small groups. Our thinking is what establishes the strongholds in our lives. They first start with a thought. And you know, when you think about a stronghold in the Bible, anytime you read, especially in the Old Testament, where they're talking about a stronghold, where the people would escape into a stronghold, it was a fortress for protection. So the people could run in and be safe from the enemy. Think about that. When you got a stronghold in your life, it has set up a fortress. Are you wondering why you struggling? Because can't nothing get in. Only the Holy Spirit can come in and break that in order for you to hear what God has to say. Amen? Uh, Philippians 2 and 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. The scripture says, let this, you let this. Pretend that, put a, put a you in front of that, which means you have to make a decision to let the mind of Christ be in you. If you don't make the decision, you're going to live defeated. And let me tell you one of the worst things, one of the worst oxymorons that we could ever come up with is a, is a uh, defeated Christian. Can you help me with that? How do we serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we live defeated lives? Because the defeat starts up here first. And if you don't believe what God has said, here, here it is. I, uh, Beth Moore did this for us in her faith, her, her belief in God. God is who he says he is. He can do what he says he can do. You are who God says you are. You can do what he says you can do. And his word is alive and active in you. Now, that ain't got nothing to do with your feelings. That has absolutely nothing to do with how you feel. 
how you feel. That's you believing that God is who he say he is. He can do what he says he can do. I am. You are who he says we are. We can do. I don't care. Lack of resources. I don't care. Lack of school. I don't care. We can do what he says we can do. And his word is alive. When you get that in your head, that has nothing to do with your feelings, though. And we let our feelings do too much dictating. And therefore, we don't have the evidence of the Holy Spirit living in us. We don't have the evidence of being filled with him. We don't have the evidence of walking with him. Amen? So you make the choice to let the mind of Christ be in you, which is also let it be in you. And then our minds has to be transformed. Paul tells us in Romans 12 too, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. That word metamorphosis. There has to be a change. And it has to be a very tangible change. When you think about metamorphosis, the, the perfect picture is the caterpillar from the butterfly. That is a tangible, can be seen, evidence-based change. Is it not? That's what that means to be transformed. There needs to be evidence-based change that the spirit is alive and well and dwelling in you. Amen? Amen. Amen. But let's look at another verse because I want to help us. Uh, Philippians chapter 4. Go to Philippians chapter 4. We're talking about we got to think differently. We got to think differently. So in Philippians chapter 4, Paul is addressing the Philippian church. And he's talking about them having peace in chapter 4. Amen? And so he gets down to chapter, uh, verse 7. And he's talking about the peace that we can have with ourselves. And he's talking in verse 8 about all these things we can think on. But before we deal with that, we need to look at chapter, we need to look at verse 7. Because verse 7 sets us up to be able to, for chapter, for verse 8 to be able to manifest. So he says, and the peace of God, which passes all comprehension. It just don't make no sense how peaceful you are. That peace, that mind-blowing peace that you have, when all, it's all chaotic and crazy, and people looking at you like you crazy because you ain't tripping. Because you, you still focused and you still aligned and you still walking and doing what God told you to do. And all this other stuff is happening. That peace, the Bible says, that peace will guard your mind and your heart. Now imagine this. The peace of God is guarding your heart and your mind. He said, now you know you got a guard. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to start thinking on things that are true. I want you to think on things that have not been concealed because that's what truth is. That's what being true is, is that it hasn't been concealed. Anything that's concealed, you, it may not be true. Anytime somebody got to hide something, it may not be true. But remember, your heart has been guarded. Your mind has been guarded. So you're free to think on things that are true. You are free to think on things that are noble, those things that are serious and dignified. You're, you're free to think on things that are just, those things that are honest and holy. You're free to think on things that are pure, clean, and modest, and innocent. You're free to think on things that are lovely, pleasing, acceptable, and grateful. You are free to think on things that are good report. Why? Because you got a guard that's protected. So if anything that tries to come that is not true, that is not, uh, you got a guard that's blocking all of that stuff. So you can, you can change your thinking. You got to know you got a guard and it's okay for you to start thinking differently about some stuff. I don't care what people say. What is the Holy Spirit saying? So you got to think differently. You got to think differently. But not only 
Do we see evidence in our thinking? We got to see evidence in our talking. We got to see evidence in our talking. Um, when I was a little girl, I used to go to vacation Bible school. I got any vacation Bible school people up in here? I'm talking about old school, old school vacation Bible school. Spend two weeks out of the summer, go 9 to 12, bus come pick you up, drop you off at the church. So we had a vacation Bible school director, and her name was Emma Jefferson. I'll never forget her. And, you know, we all, all the children be out on the steps, and she gather. She said, who wants to be the, the Bible bearer? Who wants to carry the Christian flag? Who wants to carry the American flag? And so, you know, when you got chose, you know, you was just the big thing because you got to lead the line into the church. Amen. You got to lead the line into the church. But, you know, we all excited, so we start chattering. Just start talking. And you can hear her from just real stern and firm, hair pulled up in a ball. <laughs> I can just vision it. I can just see her. But she would say to us, she said, now, children, if you need to talk, you need to talk to God. And if you need to whisper, you need to be whispering a prayer. In other words, she wanted us to be quiet. Amen? But as I thought about that, that's what we need to start doing. If we're going to talk, we need to stop talking to all these other folks and talk to God. That's how we change. If we're going to whisper, stop whispering about people and whisper a prayer about them. That's what we need to start doing. That's how our talking changes. That's how we know that the spirit is dwelling on the inside of us. So when you need to talk, talk to God. Talk to God about the situation. You ain't got to call everybody. Hear what he says first. Because he may just want to work that thing out for you. So nobody can claim that they helped you. Because, you know, we quit to claim we helped somebody. God just may want to show you that he is in the miracle working business. If you're going to whisper about somebody, whisper a prayer. Stop talking about people. You don't know them. You think you do. See, Facebook has given us this false reality about people, and we believe it. You know, I had, I had to tell some of my young people, I mean, literally, this is so crazy, but we are literally taking, uh, setting up a workshop to talk about false reality to our young people in our program. Because they, they think that what they see on Facebook is real. But you know what the sad part about it is, is we got some people who they say are adulting who think stuff on Facebook is real. Amen? We, stop, we got to stop. We got to stop doing it. We got to stop talking about it. Colossians 4 and 6 tells us, let your speech always be gracious. Let your speech always, not sometimes, not when I feel like it, not when I want to, but let your speech always be grateful, be gracious. Gracious, extending to people what they do not deserve. You're gracious. You might, they might need a, something happening with them. With they, <laughs> you might need to tell them a few things, but the scripture says, let your speech always be gracious and seasoned with salt. That means you got to sprinkle some salt on your words. Because when you think, well, you, salt is a preservative. It's there to, keep, to preserve that, that you put it on, right? Where my cook said, You want to hold it, you want to preserve it, right? Think of, God says our speech should be seasoned with salt because he wants to preserve something in the person we're talking to. But if we're tearing them down, if, if we're throwing pepper and not salt, what are we preserving? 
Salt is designed to preserve, to hold somebody, to keep them. We don't know what our words can do for somebody. It can keep them from going left. It can keep them from destroying their lives. The way we talk to them, we got to be careful, gracious, and seasoned, deliberate. That means if your thinking ain't changed, your speaking ain't going to change. Because, see, when you think, you look at, this is a child of God. So I can't talk to them any kind of way. This, a, this is a, God created this person. They may not know Jesus, but if I say what I'm going to say, they may not ever come to Jesus. If you're thinking, see, you're thinking out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if you ain't thinking right about people, you ain't going to talk right to people. You hear me? Where's your evidence at? Where's your evidence? Can people say that about you? That your talking is right? We might think some people deserve to get cussed out, but is that what we do? I'm just being real. I'm so sorry. I hope that doesn't offend you. But we might, because, you know, we operate on our feelings. So our feelings tell us that I need to tell this girl off right here and right now. But is that what God wants from us? Does that show a life that is honoring him and pleasing him? Right? So thinking. So we got to get our thinking right, our talking right. But the final thing, the final thing I want to share not only does our thinking have to be different, and it should be different as a result of all of this good preaching that we have gotten over the last, what, four months, five months now, right, almost, four months, that our thinking should, we should be approaching life differently, thinking about things differently, knowing that the Holy Spirit dwells in us. Our talking should be different. Speech is gracious, seasoned with salt, so that we know how to answer people. But not only that, our doing should be different. Our doing should be different. The scripture tells us in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do. Now that word do is a Greek word that means make, manufacture, or construct. Think about that. Whatever you Make, whatever you manufacture, whatever you construct. And look at the first thing he says. Whatever you make, manufacture, or construct with your words. Whatever you make, whatever you manufacture, whatever you construct in words, and indeed, but let's pause there, because y'all, we need to understand what we do, what our mouths are capable of doing. They can make or break. They can manufacture, or they can tear it down, or they can construct. They can construct good, and they can construct bad. When you think about our words, when I, I reference the stronghold, our words can construct strongholds in people's lives that they will never, ever hear the wooing of God to come to him because of our words, because of our doings, because of our actions, because of our, okay, let me say this, because of our nonverbals. Because well, I didn't say nothing, but yeah, yeah, you did. Your nonverbal said, I, sometimes you don't need to say nothing. Your nonverbal is enough. Them facial expressions that we so proud to give, girl, this is just how I am. No, it doesn't have to be if you're thinking differently. If the Holy Spirit is living and dwelling it, we need to come off that excuse, present company included, because we use that, y'all. This is just how I am. You can tell how I feel on my face. That ain't God. That's an excuse. And if the Holy Spirit is dwelling in us, 
then we need to be able to give off the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Let's stop using that and begin to honor God with all of our being, all of our facial expressions, all of our nonverbals. Because we're speaking just as loud in those things than when we use words. Amen? Amen. So our doing, he says, whatever you do, make, manufacture, or construct in word or deed. Do it all. Not some of it. Not a part of it. Not a third of it. Not on Sunday. Okay, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Then I'm going to get a refill. I'm going, no, no, no. He says all, all the time, at every turn, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And he repeats that in verse 22 of the same chapter. He says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily. Be excited. Be heartful about it. Be joyous about it. As unto the Lord and not unto men. And see, that's, that's a challenge for us. When we start doing, we think we're doing unto men. We ain't. I know that might not be good grammar, but we ain't. But that's what messes us up. Because our doing is unto men and not unto God. And I'm going to tell you why I know it's unto men. Because when men don't receive it, we get mad and we shut down. And we say we ain't going to do it no more because they didn't appreciate me. That's what we do. And that's why I know it is unto men and not unto God, because if God tells you, you don't care how they respond, you have done it because the Spirit has led you to do it, and you don't worry about how they feel. You don't worry if they call your name. You don't worry. That's how you know you're doing this differently, because you don't care. It's not that you get this nonchalant attitude, but you really just don't care because you know you have, and you do it in the right spirit and with all the love that is down inside of you. But you do it because you know God has led you. Amen? Amen. So doing. So where is your evidence? Your thinking has to be different. Your talking has to change. We got to change our verbiage. We got to change it. Because there are people that we are going to run into that will never grace the doors of these church. That don't mean they can't get to know Jesus. They, if I be lifted up. He didn't say we had to lift him up in church. Supposedly, he don't need lifted up in church because we all say. He need to be lifted up in the streets where the people don't know him. We want to lift him up in here. We don't want to lift him up in. It's easy to lift him up in here. We all on the same accord. It's in the out that we need to lift. He said, if I be lifted up, you go lift me up. I'll do the drawing. You do the doing. I'll do the drawing. And that's what we have to do. So our thinking has to change. See, it starts with our mindset. It starts with our thinking. We got to think differently. And once we start thinking differently, our talking will change. And when we start talking differently, our doings will change. Our doings will change. And people will say, oh, it's something about you. You must know Jesus. You feel with the Spirit. What is it about you? Just like that student said to me, I wasn't doing anything but just trying to honor God in his word. Amen? Amen. I told you this was short, sweet, and simple. Your thinking, your talking, and your doing. Come and experience transforming worship at New Covenant Christian Ministries. We have two locations. Our West Campus is located at 1760 Phillips Road, Lithonia, Georgia. Our East Campus is located at 14147 Highway 278, Covington, Georgia. For more information, please visit our website at www.newcov.org.